Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Mozilla. I'm your host, Scott Ramp, and I'm here to tell you about all the fun things that are happening this weekend and more. I got uh, Kevy Berger, and I also got uh, Courtney Imhoff. Imhoff on the show today. Um, hopefully I don't mispronounce that name for the interview that we're going to have later today as well. Wink. Um, <laughs> uh, I got some weather. I got some news. I got a whole bunch of city council and let's just get right into it. Uh, weather. Whew. How about that weather out there, people? Yesterday it was nice and sunny, good enough to go outside and hang out and have some fun. But then this cold front just came in out of nowhere. It's 15 degrees outside, and it's looking to get a little bit chillier. But of course, look, um, your uh, low tonight's gonna be 16 degrees, so it's gonna be a one degree higher than the uh, than the uh, <laughs> than the than what should be. Um, the high is gonna be 27. Um, it's gonna have the 80 percent chance of snow. The wind's gonna be pushing it around, pretty much going on throughout the day. Saturday, you're going to have that th high of 32 degrees. It's going to be mostly sunny. Sa um, Saturday night's going to be uh, partly cloudy. Uh, Sunday, you're going to see some little bit chance of snow. So it looks like old man winter is just being like, uh, just, I'll give you guys some more winter and uh, we'll let them deal with it later. So it's always, it always seems to be like this. Always so at least once in February, we're just like, just throw a little snow on that. And then there it is. Um, uh, speaking of snow, if you guys are enthusiastic about some of the snow and some of the sunshine that's happening this weekend, this weekend may be the time to go out and about on the slopes. So this is from onthesnow.com. You have uh, five degree, five inches of snow. Why do I say degrees? Forget that. Uh, five inches of snow in the Great Divide. Eight, eight inches in the Black Timon Ski area. Whitefish had four inches. Showdown had an inch. Snowball had five fresh new inches of powder. Um, Bridger Bowl had two inches. Discovery Ski Area had four inches in, la in the last 24 hours. Lost Trail has four inches. Maverick had an inch. So it looks like most places had at least a couple fresh snow, except for Big Sky Resort, which didn't have enough snow, but it's still good to go in terms of skiing. But you might expect some more snow happening in the Big Sky Resort area, which is just near Bozeman, because they usually get pretty good snow. So, um, Let's talk about some news that are happening in and around the city of Missoula. We're kicking things off with the city of Missoula is uh, planning um, in, in the l most recent public safety and health c um, city council meeting, a uh, city committee meeting. It's not a city council meeting, it's a committee meeting. Uh, they, uh, they're talking about banning vaping indoors um, to an update in a Missoula ordinance to match the state's ordinance removal of smoking within bars, taverns, and indoor facilities in general. Uh, during uh, public safety and health, part of the proposed ordinance would eliminate vapes and electronic hookahs that have become popular uh, as of late. On top of that, the ban would push the outdoor smokers further away from buildings uh, they wish to smoke near uh, while they drink. So the whole idea of this is that they want to be able, so they want um, uh, local businesses to uh, take more initiative to this. I mean, it, it, this ordinance would mean a hundred dollar fine for people who don't uh, follow these regulations. Uh, it's an ordinance. It's not necessarily a law. Um, so they'll be talking about this in upcoming meetings as well. So this is still slated for the future, but this is uh, an ordinance that they're working on. So they're uh, putting it upon the business owners to see about um, getting together on this as well. Of course, the Missoula County Sheriff's Office, and they don't have the resources to patrol for unla unlawful smokers or to uh, come write up a ticket every time someone lights up at a city park. Basically, the city is taking a cue from the University's um, of Montana's tobacco ban on campus to ban all around the Missoula area. Um, but of course, much like Boulder, Colorado, if you've, ever, I mean, if you've been to Boulder, Colorado, they, they, they encourage businesses to have signs that say, no smoking allowed in the downtown area. So. That's one of the things that are happening in the city of Missoula that uh, there always seems to be uh, one thing that happens in the city of Missoula that uh, tends to uh, uh, become a controversial issue. And this seems like one of those uh, controversial issues because there's a lot of people who do smoke. Um, of course, do you guys like the idea of drinking alcohol in the open air in the downtown area? Well, in the city of Helena, uh, grassroots push to allow open containers in the downtown El Helena area. Most of the proposed uh, areas stretch from Lewis and Clark um, Library to the Great Northern Town Center, and this is g would ha happen from 4 to 10 p.m. on weekdays, and then from noon to 10 p.m. on weekends. And this is a push for proponents saying that this is a good idea to uh, promote the downtown area. And they argued that the open container policy would allow more movement between businesses, enhancing the downtown economic picture. Um, and this is Kev Ham, and this, and he stated, uh, when people go downtown, their business will not be locked 
into one business, Ham said. It would allow downtown businesses to stay open and provide a more vibrant downtown. Ruth Mc. Ardle, uh, who lives in the place they're building in the downtown walking mall, was highly displeased with the open can entertainer policy. She said, I have already seen lower poverty values and lower quality of life from living near a operating bar. Um, Helen Independent reported... Um, uh, Helena Independent Record uh, reported that these meetings uh, with commissioners and Mayor uh, Wilmot Collins, most officials claim that they do not want a Bourbon Street in the downtown area. They also said that they've heard this before and pretty much quickly dismissed this almost right away. Uh, of course, many of the best suggestions I have in terms of uh, open container laws is that you should try having a festival which promotes, like, has outdoor drinking and stuff like that and kind of seeing how that works out and then using the data that's collected from there to see how you can push this open container thing to be a more natural thing depending upon um, because you know that's the thing about drinking is that people have a, a tendency to uh, be disorderly so um, yeah I mean you just never know but sometimes it's probably better to start small um, like some of the grassroots organizations and uh, maybe doing like kind of like a roots festival type thing that kind of like the city of Missoula does for a certain section of the area where they can have open containers during the festival time and then of course you can de depending upon how well it is and how well people behave will be a, a good determinant on whether or not you can move forward on pushing these kind of agendas okay national news of course nothing is more annoying than your dad telling you that you're the second cousin twice removed from Olympic swimmer Katie Ledecky and that is the season to talk about your sons and daughters going to the South Korea for the 2018 Winter Olympics starting today um, and of course earlier this week they were pretty much uh, promoting it like crazy I'm sure like a banner will pop up sometime somewhere between me right here. Uh, NPR reports that uh, California and Colorado are among the, the top states that will have the most young kids in the Olympics this season. And of course, here are the top 10, uh, five contributing states to the Winter Olympics. Colorado had 31 athletes, you know, Colorado has snow. California, 22 athletes. North California has snow. Minnesota, 19 athletes. More snow. New York, 18 athletes. Lots and lots of snow in upstate New York. Utah, 16 athletes. Great. Um, NBC uh, Properties will be airing the Olympics uh, today until February 25th and maybe a day or two after for closing ceremonies and whatnot. But be aware that they will compete in South Korea from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. in South Korea time, respectfully. So um, it, I transposed it for you guys. So you would ha the Olympics would basically start from 4 p.m. to 4 a.m. in America, while 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. would be like kind of like uh, the respectful time for a lot of uh, uh, Olympic coverage. But you know, um, any 24-hour uh, food places in town should uh, jump on this. Um, even if it's for the month, you could uh, stream and you can show these uh, games on while you uh, enjoy some um, bar time and whatnot. So this is usually the best times to do it because they usually, uh, a lot of times, uh, people go out and about and they can see these games at the bars. And yeah, I mean, and I'll tell you more about all your events that you can happen on later on this week as well. I have a nice little, uh, short little commercial promoting our Saturday drop-ins. And when I return, I'll have Kevy and I'll have Courtney on here to talk about hospice ball. So stay with me. Hi everyone, we're back here with uh, KB Berger 
and Courtney Imhoff. Yeah. And you guys are here to talk about the hospice ball that's coming yes. up here through the Hospice Care Foundation. Mm -hmm. Hospice Care Foundation is a uh, is a hospice care here in the city of Missoula, and it's yeah. run through um, your own organization, a nonprofit mm -hmm. here in town, to help yes. people with uh, with arrangements. Well, we we're actually really unique. Is that we are a fundraising organization. And so we don't provide direct services, but what we do is like fundraising through special events and activities, and then we're able to give out uh, financial assistance uh, to hospice organizations, as well as hospice patients and their families throughout Western Montana. Oh, cool, so you yeah. help people pay for certain costs. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, provide for them and support them, and oh my goodness, do so much. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, Courtney, tell us about uh, the hospice ball. So the hospice ball is on its 37th annual year, wow. which is incredible in and of itself. But the thing that I think stands out is that every year is different for the hospice ball. So it, there's a theme every year. Um, and this year is, is 1940s, Night at the Star. So um, people can really get into it. They can dress up. It truly is a gala mm -hmm. event. Mm -hmm. um, and there's so much to do once you get there, of course. You know, it is a nonprofit fundraiser, so there is going to be the silent auction and the live auction, but there's also entertainment, there's multiple photo booths, there's um, bingo, the, or Kino. excuse me, Kino this yep. year. Bingo and um, Kino. Yeah, and, and there's Raffle Alley, and oh, so yeah. I mean, it, there's just really is anything that you could possibly want all in one night. Cool, mm -hmm. and this is happening this weekend, right? It's, it's February 23rd. Yep. Oh, 23rd. Yep. So it's quite a ways away. For two weeks. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and, it's <laughs> and it's happening from 6 to midnight at yes. the Hilton Garden Inn. Yep. And it's in the uh, the conference rooms on the, uh, basically on the it's the south ball side. Room. It's the entire ball ballroom and the rotunda. Yep. Wow. So it, we kind of. It's a takeover. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so how many people did you get last year? And how many people do you hope to get this year? We usually get between uh, four and 500. Wow. So it always really depends upon the weather. Um, we usually sell, you know, between that four and 500. Uh, anywhere between three and 400 actually show up. Uh, it really depends on the weather. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So. So hopefully this will be a year in our favor. Right? <laughs> Unlike this morning, which right. is horrible, but... Well, you know, uh, it's always a prelude to nicer weather, because right. if, if, if you That's think, so like, yesterday's like a switch, and it's like, eh, let's throw someone at them one more right? time. Yes, let's yesterday we were not wearing jackets and outside in the sun. Yes. Yes. That's yes. yes. true. Yeah. yeah. But and you'll be inside, so you don't have to, you know, weather well, regardless. True. You'll be uh, inside enjoying the ballroom and enjoying exactly. a nineteen a nineteen twenties nineteen forties nineteen forties night of stars. Uh, so if you think of like the men with their slacks and their suspenders and their fedora, and then the women with the long dresses and the gloves and the fascinators. So yeah, it's very elegant, very Marilyn Monroe. I there like to go. think. Yeah. Of. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and of course, if uh, they need more information, they can always go to hospiceball.com. Or they can just call us at 541-2255. And one thing, too, that I wanted to mention is we are running an online auction mm -hmm. right now through Town Square Media. So mm -hmm. if people can't make it to the actual event, mm -hmm. they can go online and they can look at some of the items that they can bid. And that will run through the 12th of February. So even if you can't necessarily make it the night of, you can still participate and still give back to Hospice Care Foundation if you'd like to do that. So mm -hmm. they can find out that information through Town Square Media. They can also find it on the website too. Yep. So it's Hospice uh, Foundation, or is it hospicefoundation.org? It's our, well, if you go to the, for the Hospice Ball, it's hospiceball.com. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to learn more about our organization, it's hcfmissoula.com. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. So is there anything else? Um, just one more plug for your... Well, just everybody should come out. It's a great time. Uh, it's super fun. And we just want to make sure that uh, everybody look at the website and on our <laughs> social media on Monday the 12th. We have a little uh, yes. surprise that's going Sneak. to be happening. If some people want to come, they haven't been able to attend before, they haven't come in quite a few years, Please look at our social media, our websites, yeah. or call our office to find out what's happening on Monday the 12th because that's something pretty exciting and really opens the ability to attend to all of Missoula regardless of your income levels. Great. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining me, guys. Thank, Thank you guys for so much. Having us. And stay with us. We, guess, uh, we still got plenty more show.
IgM is intersex mut genital mutilation. It's what happened to me. It is what happens to thousands and thousands of children worldwide. The World Health Organization just came out with a statement this month condemning IgM for the very first time. If we could here in, Mon in Missoula, Montana, commit to having this practice ended, it would be a huge step forward globally. This is a real problem. People aren't being given a choice. People aren't being given the ability to make their own choice. They're having it stolen from them. Not only that, hate crime legislature protects me. If I so choose to, to, to change my gender, I want to be protected because I do have an XY chromosome and I do identify as male sometimes. And that's my prerogative. I want to be protected when I go out in public with my loved one, whoever that may be. Thank you. The squirrels still have pretty good habitat requirements being met by those other seed sources, and they still have the ability to target the, uh, the white bark pine. And so basically, those cones are hammered, and there are none left for dispersal by nutcrackers. But if you moved up the ridge in that same area, the same high mortality area, same glacier, and you go to a climax stand, a more pure white bark pine stand, that becomes really inhospitable habitat for red squirrels. What we speculate is because we've measured a lot of the structure, the structure is actually really not that different, but what's different is the species composition. So the idea is we all know conifer cone crops cycle through time. If you have only one species, you have dips in that cycle and they can't sustain a population of squirrels through that. Uh, if you have multiple species kind of lagging behind, you have a better opportunity um, for squirrel abundance. So you go up that hill and you still see a lot of the white park dead, but you see cones remaining for nutcrackers at the end of the, the season. And um, so that's kind of the impact of squirrels thinking about the energy of white bark pine and squirrels focusing on that. That story still plays out for nutcrackers, which we heard and we've seen pictures of, but I'll pass this around just to get an idea of their distribution, which is down here, this lower map. Hey guys, welcome back. Now it's time for Pre-Critic. Uh, oh, jeez. Yeah, there's a lot of movies coming out this weekend and nothing, well, you know, I guess uh, once, twice, three times lady. Uh, it's Valentine's Day and inside the cinematic universe, that comes from Twilight series, true that, comes uh, its cousin who just kind of thinks it's cool but becomes self-aware and you have to destroy it before it comes too late. Um, Fifty Shades Free continues the adventures of Dakota Johnson's character as she gets married to the man from pre the previous films whose name was in the first movie named Grey. Anyways, watch this. Uh, these contracts expire on screen in this movie about love? And all about that TNA that has been teased in the last couple of films. Um, of course, don't tease me if you ain't going to please me. But you will not please me because you are Fifty Shades. Um, yeah, you know the old story of Peter Rabbit who steals from old man Mr. McGregor in the garden per warning of his mother who lost her husband to Mr. McGregor long ago. Seems simple enough. But throw the concept out the window and you have a computer in a rabbit voiced by James Corden Wow, autocorrect even knows how to spell his name. Uh, so, <laughs> anyways, watch this movie. Notwithstand the test of time, as it uses modern references and comedy cues uh, to get butts in theaters for this family adventure targeted at children. Um, yeah. Moving on. Apparently, this is a Clint Eastwood film. I didn't know it. I looked it up, and this is very, and uh, which honestly. Uh, describes the really, really simple synopsis: a group of military soldiers stops a terrorist plot on a train towards France. That's it. That's, that's basically the movie. U.S. soldiers and a small movie budget centered around a non-exploding train. It's directed by Clint Eastwood, which explains the very short synopsis of the movie. Uh, man, talk about movies with a pro-military theme in the last couple years. Mr. Eastwood, we need another Western. Your son could use a franchise. And that's the end of Pre-Critic. So uh, thanks uh, for joining me for Pre-Critic. Uh, I'm not ending my show, but I got plenty of other stuff to talk about, which I will get to right camera two.
Hi. Um, let's talk about some uh, city council stuff. So. I have a lot of city council, and I'm going to go through this as fast as I possibly can. I deleted a lot of quotes because this this one public works community meeting was ridiculous because there's so much to talk about. March 5th is the public hearing for agenda item uh, that affects the side streets. They're the Missoula Public Library. The Missoula Public Library is talking about uh, building a boulevard, um, trying to figure out a way that best suits people to uh, have access to the library and walk around the library. There's a lot of uh, speculation saying that's like they want to be able to just, just be able to get out of the car, go to the library without dealing with uh, grass and all sorts of things. So here is Drew Larson. Um, he's from Missoula Del Development Services. He talks about the library and the area in which the library will be built. So here is a little bit of uh, background and uh, just to catch you guys up on what's going on with the new public library. A vacation is necessary to construct the new bond funded Missoula Public Library. So the subject property and right of way um, are located in downtown Missoula and is surrounded by a mix of residential, commercial, and civic uses, including a theater to the north, the Missoula Children's Theater or Community Theater, religious assembly, and other residential uses. Um, it's The existing site is highlighted here in blue, and I will change these colors because they kind of fade on this uh, for the public hearing. And then the new Block 6 of McCork Edition, the new Mo Missoula Public Library site is in green, and the subject right away is in red there. So the Block 6 of McCork Edition, uh, where the subject right away exists, was acquired by Missoula County as part of a land exchange with the former property owner in order to construct the new Missoula Public Library. Uh, the developer has since demolished all existing structures in preparation for the new construction, so the site is currently uh, completely void of any structures. All right, so as you can see, this is where they're going to do the new library. This is the MCT uh, Central School Building, and this is the current library. This whole area is completely uh, being prepped for uh, development. They're going to be, first of all, they're going to be building a parking lot, first and foremost, and they're going to basically be building a library kind of on top of that uh, pre existing area as well. So, uh, uh, one of the things is the city wants to figure out what they're going to do with the sidewalks and parking when they put in this new library. Parks and Rec direct design alternative to the city. Andrew Larson mentioned this, um, and this is what he had to say about in terms of concepts, and this is the boulevard. So this is Parks Alternative is what they're looking at. So this would be uh, Front Street here, and then this would be the parking lot here. Backwards? No? Nope. Okay. Yeah, it does. It does lower. They're going in. So yeah, Front Street. Thank you, Neil. And parking lot here. Um, so this was on January 26th. Uh, they resubmitted their comments uh, in response to the memo, memo the architect had provided, uh, reaffirming that their preference for this alternative plan. All right, so this is the alternative plan for what they want to do with the street. Um, it's it's pretty simple. You have your trees on either side of you, giving you that nice little shade. Um, they, um, and then, of course, here the streets right here are going to represent your uh, side streets and the parking lot, kind of like just a nice little space in between, and it's kind of like be a nice little walkway. Um, and that's what they're kind of try to do. Um, so uh, many of the issues, but of course I've seen from the concept, are the amount of brush and trees that would be in the way from people trying to cross the street. Think about it in terms of this. If you have a bunch of trees and a bunch of brush as you're going to cross the street and people are driving by, there's trees there, but they can't necessarily see you. So when you're crossing the street, you have to go out a little bit further on the crosswalk just so people can see you, and hopefully they stop. That's, that's just a hope. But here's, here's Neil Miner. He's with Parks and Rec. He's representing uh, Donna Gockler this time, who wants uh, more green and suggests that this uh, project can happen adjacent to the library's construction. So, so this, is, this is what Parks would prefer, a 10-foot boulevard. It gives you a 6-foot sidewalk and then a 9-foot additional landscaped area between the sidewalk and the library parking. Um, these are some examples of that instance. Uh, one uh, design concern from the design team was at this point the sidewalk, as shown, is below the curb level. Uh, these examples are across the street at the Missoula Children's Theater. Uh, in this case, the curb level, this is Broadway. The curb level is two plus feet over eight foot boulevard 
to the sidewalk um, down, similar to what this would, instance would be. All right. So um, currently, the the new the uh, current um, um, Missoula uh, Public Library has a all uh, basically all cement brick uh, concrete. Um, to their front entrance and their main entrance off the uh, front street entrance. No, wait, wait, it's Main Street, sorry. It's Main Street entrance. The front street side is how you get access to the parking lot and go through their uh, rear uh, bottom entrance. Um, let's see here, let me look at my notes. Alan Buchanan, MNR, MN, MRA, Missoula Redevelopment Agency, gives an example how they can go about making this boulevard. Kind of wrestling with this same issue on uh, an MBT ADA project that they're doing downtown, where they're going to be modifying a lot of the intersections, and um, two of them are Higgins and Front and Higgins and Main. So, we're, and there you do have some parallel parking and some diagonal parking at the end of the day. And I've asked the the engineers on that project whether or not there's a way to go ahead and incorporate bulb outs now take advantage of the fact that, that MDT is going to tear these out in the next months and um, do it in such a way that you don't have to completely tear the thing out when the when the uh, traffic changes direction. All right, so that was Alan Buchanan with MRA. Um, the next thing I have here is from Anora Bray. She's the Missoula Public Library Director, talks about the problems with having a boulevard um, adjacent to the library. Because when the snow is plowed, then it sits in the boulevard. And moms are, every, uh, three days a week we have tiny tails at 1030 in the morning. We have 50 parents with 50 or 60 children that come to that. And the moms have strollers and everything. They have to get out, crawl over that bank of snow, or walk down the street with their children to be able to access the sidewalk. And so for me, it's a huge safety concern. Um, the same thing with disabled people. Um, if they can step out of their vehicle onto a sidewalk, it's much easier for them than to step out onto a berm of snow. So, um, All right, so that was um, uh, the library director, Anora Bray. And there was many sides to this, and the library hopes to be accessible by all walks of life without the hassle of having these boulevards be used in the pile of snow. So it's like grass, uh, sidewalk, more grass. That's kind of what they, they're proposing for this so they can plant trees and whatnot, kind of have like a nice little area for people to walk through. But then the whole problem comes to the access to this area because um, you know it's a nice separation from the road if you, in concept, but it's also a separation from the road for people who need to get around get to the sidewalk from the side park in the side streets or like a drop-off zone and whatnot so it's it's an interesting thing how they're going to move about doing this and I think one of the uh, more difficult things at the current public library is that they have these kind of boulevards already on the adjacent streets so you have these two streets kind of uh, going perpendicular uh, which is uh, uh, Main Street and then you have um, uh, front Street, and then on these sides of the roads, there's sidewalks right there, but then they have those kind of boulevards where there's grass on either side, and I can see where they're kind of coming from in terms of that. So uh, this item will be continued to be discussed in future meetings, and a public hearing is set for March 5th. So if you guys have any suggestions how to uh, uh, basically have a way to plant trees without disrupting um, basically allowing people who are ADA, who need ADA accessibility to basically get right on the sidewalk almost as soon as they get out, out of a vehicle. All right, let's move on to admin and finance. Um, this is an interesting topic because they're, they're talking about several uh, mountain water company policies, now Missoula Water, um, uh, Missoula City of Water, if you've driven by their sign, and business practices that were not well understood and that these would be clarified or updated by amending the ordinance after the city operates the utility for a period of time. This proposed resolution is to establish a schedule of tapping fees for taps on existing water mains as part of updates they determine would be prudent to make. So here's John Wilson, and he talks about water taps that anybody who wishes to uh, tap into the water main uh, would have to go through. And uh, that this is one of those things. Uh, the past practice at Mountain Water was to charge a deposit and then refund that deposit after uh, making a water tap for a new connection. 
and uh, uh, it was for whatever reason that was a private business practice but it goes against our uh, long-standing policy and every utility I've ever worked with of those charges that can clearly be uh, uh, attributed to a direct beneficiary like uh, a tap for an individual customer we try to recover those costs from that customer so all of our customers aren't uh, paying those costs or subsidizing that all right, so that was John Wilson. He is the uh, uh, he's the uh, new operations manager over at the uh, Missoula Water Company. They intend to update Missoula Water Companies to match just, uh, standards of the most water utility standards to help costs and mitigate fees. Heidi West asks a hypothetical, and Scott Pasco answers. If hypothetically speaking, no, I am building a seven-unit townhouse development, so I would have a one tapping fee per unit or would it be like how does that break down in cost wise and then what sort of a service line would you know goes with say a home versus you know what's the standard size so to clarify it all depends on is a seven unit townhouse going to be all in your name would be one answer oh, no. so, so they're right they would be individually owned in the long okay, run okay then each individual would have to have a, a separate shut off valve and a separate meter connection so each one, and then depends on the size, depends on the location, they would have to pay that $350 per service line going into the property because the property owner, the townhouse owner, owns the service line all the way to the main. All right, so that uh, hopefully that helps clarify some um, certain things about how uh, these water taps to the water main would be. Um, Scott Pasco also talks about uh, private practices. Settle the corp, the labor and everything, and charge a deposit, but they used to capitalize that. And that capitalization, along with whatever the admin fee at that time was, whether it was 5% or 30 or 50%, then that cost would be capitalized and put into to the rate. And then every customer has to pay Perhaps you could explain rates. to the council what a, a typical type of business would have a two inch or a four inch service. As you get into anything larger than two inch, they're, they're quite mm -hmm. large services. They're not that common. A lot of the engineers and architects will look at different uh, structures and, and they'll do a fixture count and stuff and determine what size meter, what size service line that you need. So um, a lot of uh, businesses in that, um, small like hair cutting places, or uh, um, Quizno, Subway, stuff like that. A lot of them can do a, a one-inch um, regular service, and, but they also have to have an additional connection for a fire line. So have it separate um, if their fire sprinklers have to be. The larger the business, the larger the, whatever they use per fixture count in that, the more water. So, and this is all sized by how much water each place would end up using. All right, so that was uh, Scott Pascal. Um, I think, uh, okay, so the water company prefers to have two water systems in place in city neighbors because, of course, one may, must be devoted to fire engine use, along with the other one being your typical uh, um, usage for lawns and care and your uh, basic household uh, utilities. Of course, the motion was passed, uh, well, moved to uh, the consent agenda. Most of these community media items aren't approved they just get moved to another meeting which is monday in which they will be voted on so that kind of concludes that meeting i think it's pretty interesting how like things have kind of shifted um the way basically long story short which you know i like to tell stories a lot longer than they should be i guess i get it from my mother um is that mountain water company um had the rate payers like the the general Funding the budget to pay for the to um, to pay for these water mains these uh, the tapping to the water mains. But it, when Missoula took over, um, they basically said that the individual would pay for it without making your neighbors pay for it. Basically, all right. So let's talk about some parks and conservation. I think this is pretty interesting because they're doing an update on the Moon Randolph Homestead. The City Council is adopting a strategic plan for the Moon Randolph Homestead. The last two years, the homestead has been very busy. Um, council members requested an update to implementation implement, implementation of a strategic plan. This presentation will highlight efforts to preserve this important cultural site, educate the public about Missoula's past, and discuss plans, challenges for future work. Morgan Valiant. Conser uh, conservation land manager and uh, Caroline Stevens, Moon Randolph Homestead caretaker, 
caretaker presented at a meeting um, on Wednesday. And um, here is Morgan Valiant talking about the uh, activity at the Moon Randolph Homestead site. We've had a lot of momentum. There's been more that has happened in the last year and a half than I've seen happen up at the homestead in the last nine years. And so, um, and a lot of it has to do uh, with, with multiple things, but mainly we've got some really passionate caretakers up there right now that are doing a great job. Uh, and we have a really good guiding document that lays out a game plan on where to go um, and what to do. So I'm not going to talk too long. I'm going to turn it mainly over to Caroline so that you get an understanding of the programs and kind of goals for the site. Um, but I will give you a little background uh, of how the site fits in with our conservation lands uh, management program. So right now, the city has about 4,200 acres of public natural areas around the valley uh, that are managed under our conservation lands management program. I am the conservation lands manager. I work with Parks and Rec. It's one of the three programs within the operations division of Missoula Park, Parks and Rec, so the maintenance division. Uh, from our 2000. All right, so um, kind of like I'm just kind of kind of skipping over a lot of it of what he says is that a lot of, they do a lot. Uh, Morgan Valiant is manager, and he kind of works with uh, limited budgets, and he's trying to figure out ways to um, come up with projects based on funding because there's always a lot, there's more projects there's more projects than there are funding, so it's coming up with a strategic plan to help have the momentum for earning money, and what a lot of the Moon Randolph Homestead has been doing recently has been raising money through uh, programs. They have an apple picking thing, so you pay to pick apples, um, and they also have other like camps and summer things, t and I'll talk more about this later in the thing as well, but of course, through this meeting, the two uh, folks presented about land conservation and how Moon Randolph is an important part of the Missoula community and its history. This is a 470 acre area for public use and it's just off waterworks hill it's not even that far away and it's just like you kind of go there and there's as soon as you get there you're just like you're basically surrounded by farmland and a bunch of old barns that are at least a hundred years old from what a lot of from what i heard from a lot of them of course mcat did an out and about joel barrett hosted a show called, with missoula out and about and you can watch it anytime at mcat.org just a nice little plug and you can kind of find out what this site features which allow of course um this site is really cool because uh they have uh, on-site caretakers the only thing um that they do is that they live on the land and they just take care of the land and make sure nobody steals stuff that's kind of like the uh the the, the the quick in of it so here's caroline stevens she's a caretaker uh, and she talks about the new roles that she brought to the homestead as soon as she started doing some caretaking. Myself and then my partner Katie, we live up there year round. Um, our role is to live there and protect the resource, but also to be the primary interpreters for the site. So we staff all of our open hours, which are from May to October on Saturdays. Um, and we also do a lot of tours and interpretation for any school groups or visitors that come to the site. Um, but I think since the previous caretaker, Matt LaRubio, that caretaker role has shifted a little bit and become a little bit more like professionalized, perhaps you could say. Um, Matt took our fall gathering, which was a potluck, and turned it into a dollar-generating fundraiser, um, which of course takes a lot more planning and, and organizing. And so part of our role is is development and fundraising and a little bit of grant writing um, to support that, as well as you know doing a lot of event planning and really providing a lot of opportunities for the public to come to the homestead and to share in this resource and experience this resource that we have in our community. All right, so uh, moving on to the um, more other things that are happening within the topic, um, a brief history of uh, Moon Miranda home Homestead. Uh, back in the day, the Moon family bought a play, uh, basically homesteaded in the um, 19th century and sold it to the Randolph family in 1907 until they died in the 1950s. And the land was sold via open space bond to the city of Missoula in 1997, in which the city just kind of held on to. Uh, 2015 was the year which offered uh, positions to caretakers like Caroline and her partner to live and maintain the homestead. The homestead is open to the public Saturdays from 11 to 5 p.m. Um, May through October. Um, you can walk over uh, from the North Hills trailhead or drive up to the homestead itself. Caroline talks about the camps as uh, an example of many of the programs that they kind of started over at the homestead. 
my favorite events that we have during the year is homestead camp. Last year, we did three weeks of homestead camp, which is run through Parks and Rec's Outdoor Recreation Program, the MORE program. And I'm the lead facilitator for those. Um, and it's, it's an amazing opportunity for kids to spend a lot of time at the homestead. These kids who come to homestead camp get to spend more time than any other kid does um, throughout the year at the homestead. Um, they come for half day, week long camps. And every day they start the day by doing chores. And when you ask them at the end of the week what their favorite thing from the homestead camp was, they say chores. And that blows their parents' mind and is endlessly frustrating. But All right, so <laughs> that was uh, one of the examples of some of the programs that they do on there as, w uh, as well. And, of course, the City of Missoula Council members asked a lot about the camps after the fact be for their kids. But just so you know that the camps are available in March, but they have a tendency to fill up pretty quickly. Uh, $6,000 a year are provided from the city for the upkeep upkeep of the facility, but fundraising helps them plant trees, uh, divert payments to providing adequate water, and of course, a rainy day fund that goes into the Moon Randolph Fund. So let's talk about some of the things that um, the Moon Randolph Homestead faces as it gets older and older and some of the buildings are starting to um, be a little more dilapidated. Um, and so the, the site is kind of on the verge of falling apart, and it always has been. But, um, you know, trying to figure out what we want to keep and how we want to move forward and how, what, how we want to use the site as a community is what that 2015 strategic plan really did. Um, here's some of the spirit and mission, of course. It is a place of recycling. Nothing was thrown away. Everything was reused. Every one of those structures is built some portions of it out of materials that the Randolphs hauled back after they delivered groceries to people on the valley floor. The, the barn is built out of old boxcars from the railroad from the 1890s. Um, and it really, uh, really embodies that reuse and repair and salvage that um, so many of these uh, small homesteads you just had to. If, if you had to reuse everything, Bob Oaks always jokes that um, all the Randolph's clothes that we found on site were basically patches sewn on top of patches, and it's it's true. Um, all right, so um, that kind of talks about some of the uh, uh, the the status of where uh, the Moon Randolph Homestead is at at this point. The main point of the presentation was to get a strategic plan and how they want to move forward in future fundraising projects and how they're going to use the money to help improve infrastructure, storage, and a safe place for groups to enter these old buildings. Because at one point they had a um, a building collapse and it had a little bunch of old historic uh, uncategorized things there as well. So uh, Morgan talks about the importance of the Moon Randolph as a whole. You know, as Missoula grows, we are going to have to make hard decisions about historic structures. Some of them will end up going. I mean, the Merck went. We just tore down our first school uh, in, in town next to the library. You guys know all this. Uh, sometimes you've got to make hard decisions. We've got a site right now that preserves uh, Missoula's history, and we, it is protected, but it is not going to last forever. And so we do have opportunities to invest in preserving our cultural heritage in, in Missoula. They exist, and they're up here at the Moon Randolph Homestead. So it's something to really think about uh, as we move forward uh, with management of this site and as we come to you uh, asking for help with management of the site as well. Um, okay, so um, many of the city council were in favor of um, keeping um, this uh, keeping this thing going and showing their support uh, with such a huge structure in trouble. Morgan is working towards a solution on how to save and preserve these buildings, including signs that indicate the property line. The city moved forward on supporting their plan to raise money and suggest a friends group, uh, you know, friends of of Moon Randolph Homestead, and they have organizations like this that are nonprofits that help fundraising for these organizations as well. And this is uh, a city-owned property, um, so. Uh, by having a friends of organization, it allows it to have a nonprofit status to help support uh, these kinds of um, programs and more. So, if you are interested in learning out, learning more information, you can go to moonrandolphhomestead.org. It is a wonderful website. Um, let me. I, I totally forgot to load it, but here is a nice little website of representation of the Moon Randolph Homestead, and it tells you everything that you need to know. It has some pictures of all sorts of um, 
uh, livestock, animals, history. You can click on here to find out more information about homestead history, the beautiful pictures, the old stuff that was used back in those days. Um, just a whole bunch of open land. It's 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 owned by the city. It's public land. It's open use plan, uh, open space land as well. So anybody can look on that, and anyone can be part of that. Um, but if you want more information about this meeting and more of the meetings that I just did, because I had a lot of meetings I talked about. I, I talked a lot. I had them talk a lot. But I just want to give you a nice representation of a lot of the committee meetings. Um, you can go to ci.missoula.mt.us. It is a wonderful website where you can find out more information on that. Um, you can go to mcat.org to find those meetings and more. Um, our Saturday drop-ins are every Saturday from 1 to 5 p.m. on Saturdays. So if you want to miss a Saturday drop-in, you guys can go to the Moon Rand of Homestead instead to enjoy that as well. So let's switch gears and let's go on to some of the events that are happening starting Friday um, this morning. So Miz, uh, uh, Missoula Indoor Sports Arena, Mismo Gymnastics, and Roots Acro Sports Center are a great gymnastics place for your kids to do some adult, to do some tumbling and some foam pits and some trampolines. And this happens pretty much from 9 a.m. to 12. Um, times usually vary, but they're usually all around the same time. Um, and you get your options. Tiny Tales and Family Story Time are starting at 10.30 a.m. at the Missoula Public Library. So if you want your kids to um, uh, start uh, using their brains and start learning a couple new words every other day. Tiny Tales and Family Story Time is the place to be. Glowing Flies, Spectrum Discovery Center are talking about glowing flies in their uh, science discovery place. So you guys can check that out. It's at 812 Tool Avenue, just across from, um, God, Draftworks Brewery. Sorry, <laughs> I completely forgot what that brewery was called. Yarns and Watercolor is at the Museum Public Library starting at noon today. If you're interested in doing some stitching, make your own clothes using yarns. Yarns is the place to be at the Museum Public Library. But if you're interested in doing some watercolor and doing some painting and whatnot, the Museum Public Library is also doing it at noon. Um, the Eyes Have It, First Person Structure in Nonfiction. Turner Hall's Dell Brown Room, writer Gina Oshner will be visiting the University of Montana to present a fiction craft lecture titled Mistakes I Have Made and Great Advice I Wish I've Taken to Heart. At noon today, um, the Dell Brown Room at the Turner Hall, she'll give a reading at the same day at the same location at 7 p.m. tonight as well. Um, Valentine's Day Stay, Lolo Hot Springs. Um, stress out about Valentine's, uh, book any stay from February 9th, 18th, and get a free bottle of champagne so that oh wait that's just a promotion never mind skip it <laughs> i thought it was pretty interesting because they're already talking about valentine's day um hill and garden Inn is doing the missoula building industry association home so home show from february 9th to the 11th kicking off today at 3 p.m the hilton, hilton garden inn and this is a uh, bunch of different times it's a family friendly kids 12 and under getting free if you're 13 and up it's five dollars a ticket and of course tickets are available at hill garden inn and it's a building industry association show so it's a great way for for um, builders, contractors, real estate agents, lenders, and more for this three-day show. Um, Teddy Bear Sleepover. Um, yeah, Missoula Public Li Library hosts one of these um, every other Friday, it seems like. You can bring your favorite stuffed animal to a special story time, and you can eat a snack and listen to a story before tucking your friend in for the night. The next morning, um, the Missoula Public Library will have all your stuffed animals all tucked away, and you can pick up your friends in the large meeting room. And this happens at 4.30 today, but then, uh, then you can pick them up um, Saturday from, uh, from 10 a.m., to 11 a.m. Silk screening demonstration that is happening at the Zootown Arts Community Center. Um, all my tops are just plain white v-neck t-shirts. In fact, I have a, a lot of blank going on on my scarves and tote bags and other shirts. How did this happen? So, the Zach Zootown Arts Community Center is hosting a silk screening demonstration. Bring your um, blank shirts and have some nice art. Zach always has some really nice art that you can put on your shirts. So bring your plain shirts on down there and they will take care of that for you as well. Starting at 5.30 p.m. And they also have a bunch of other programs there as well. Here are some of your late night events happening tonight um, before we jump into an interview that our very own Joel Bear had with our Sue Buskey from the Buskey Group. Uh, opera, um, Handel's uh, Julius Caesar is going to be at MCT Center for Fruit Program for for performing arts at 7.30 p.m. Um, if you like 90s music, the Badlanders place for you. Dead Hipster will be hosting a I Love the 90s dance party at the Badlander late night tonight. 
Uh, Jackson Holt and the Highway Patrol is going to be at Monks starting at 9. Um, it's going to happen all night. So these these events I'm telling you now are kind of like uh, late, late nights, bar hopping, grouping things, all sorts of stuff like that. You got uh, VFW is having a funk rock music uh, the Shiver is going to be playing at the Union Hall, um, Union Club, not Union Hall. Union Club's the bar. Union Hall is the upstairs. The, Smir the Scurfs and Lockstar Cartel is going to be the Top Hat Lounge, and the Hankers is going to be at the Sunrise Saloon, um, at the at the Sunrise Saloon. Country music. So enjoy all that and more. But without further ado, here is a nice little interview with Sue Buskey from the Buskey Group by our very own Joel Baird. Hi everyone, I'm Joel Baird, the General Manager of Missoula Community Access Television with an important short program about upcoming interesting opportunities for you to help us at MCAT shape the future of local media in Missoula. My guest with me is Sue Buskey of the Buskey Group. She's a consultant that's helping the city of Missoula and MCAT put together public input focus groups that are coming up April 3rd and 4th at the Missoula Public Library, and we want you to participate. So let's talk about it. Welcome, Sue, and thanks so much for being on this little segment. Well, I'm pleased to be here. I've only had spent a couple days here in Missoula, but I'm already excited about the project and about being able to do things to help people understand better what the opportunities are that are going to be available as a result of this uh, franchise renewal process with Charter. Excellent. So you are helping the City of Missoula and MCAP put together these focus groups mm -hmm. and my understanding is you you would like the groups to be sort of like-minded in uh, activity like okay we're gonna have government we'll have educators here mm -hmm. but people are invited to come to anything that would also suit their schedule right because some people work in the day some people are tired in the evening yeah I mean the idea is that it you know sometimes you're just more comfortable talking to people who have a common interest like arts or if you're a parent and you're interested in the schools but because we have four of them and because everybody isn't available at exactly the same time what we've tried to do is to say hey come to the one that's of most interest to you or come to the one that fits your schedule. The important thing is to come. Yeah, and towards that end, we're incentivizing people's visits with some door prizes, with some refreshments while they're there, and of course with the satisfaction of knowing that their voice would be heard in shaping the future of local communication in the city of Missoula. Absolutely. And, you know, not only are you going to get a chance to come and participate at a focus group, and by the way, I hear you have some really cool prizes. I have that. assembled a few <laughs> interesting Very door prizes, cool prizes to your viewer. But also, there's going to be a chance to participate um, by participating, coming in, in, and participating in an online survey. And that online survey will launch April 3rd, the day of the first focus group, okay. and will stay open till May 30th. So, you know, come to the focus groups, then go online and do the survey, um, and, uh, and there's even going to be a public hearing sometime later in May. But we need people to come out to every and participate in every one of these events. Yeah, and um, I hope you, dear viewer who are watching, would think you could be one of this group. It's not going to be super intimidating. It's going to be in the large meeting room of the Missoula Public Library. It's located at 301. East Main Street, just a little to the east of Higgins Street in downtown Missoula. And the, the groups will consist of about 20, we're thinking 20 to 30 folks. And you could be one of them. They'll be about two hours long, and they're going to be entertaining, not taxing. So if you are at all interested, you have questions about it, visit the MCAT.org website. There is a page there you can click on, it says Focus Groups or give us a call, 542-6228, or email me, mcat at mcat.org. It's that simple, and we hope to see you at a focus group soon. Hey guys, welcome back. Uh, thanks, Joel, uh, for that nice uh, informative information about how you and the public can help us with those kind of things, uh, just like in terms of how you want MCAT's future to do. Um, so there isn't too much time going on here, Winter Market is happening Saturday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, Z-Town Kickers at Missoula Indoor Sports Arena from 1 a.m. to uh, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. tomorrow, and it's for kids to learn to play soccer. Uh, and also, uh, Karis Nursery is hosting an orchid show, uh, Sale and Talks, and they're talking about the perfect arrangement that you guys can give to your loved one during Valentine's Day. 
Once again, MCC Saturday Drop-In is happening from 1 to 5 p.m. on ev every single Saturday. It's for $10. Just drop in. Just do it. It's very simple. You don't need a RSVP or anything like that. Uh, you got Winter Wellness Series. is Fighting Fake News Workshop at the Missoula Public Library. So if you like the keyword fake news and you want to learn more about it, go to the Missoula Public Library starting at 2 p.m. All in, all in for kids poker tournament. Hey, c get your kids to gamble, and top prizes get a hundred dollar buy-in to raise money for Love Has Come. Payouts for top four uh, places limited to 120 people. Um, register for four at the door. Okay, sorry, this is uh, for kids. This is not uh, to have kids gamble. My bad. Scratch that. <laughs> Climb for a cause. Mizzou Food Bank is teaming up with Freestone Climbing Center where you guys um, can give money to uh, the climbing, uh, the Freestone Climbing Center at 1200 Shakespeare Street, um, which is now uh, doing a bouldering and rope climbing fund for the whole family. Um, you get, uh, get some non-perishable food items. They're ex uh, accepted as extra donations for the friends and neighbors throughout the Mizzou Food Bank. Um, so... There's a Y dance at the uh, YMCA at 6 p.m. tomorrow night. So this is for a semi-formal sweetheart dance. Girls and their father figures will enjoy music, dancing, and more right here. So it's a father-daughter dance, which will be happening for your uh, Saturday night. Okay, so I have to wrap up. I have to end the show. I got some nice, cool little music for you guys. So uh, here is uh, some original music uh, by me. So uh, prepare yourself. Um, thanks for joining me and for... Uh, Wake Up Missoula, I'm Scott Ramph.